We are pleased to welcome Shobana Ayer from Swan Chambers, practicing barrister and vice chair of the Legal Services Committee of the Bar Council of England and Wales, and one of the principal authors of the Bar Council's guidance on Gen AI. Shobana is a commercial barrister and arbitrator with experience in a wide variety of sectors, in addition to the uses and implications of legal tech, law tech, and fintech services. Shobana is a leader in addressing the legal issues and regulation of emerging technologies from artificial intelligence and blockchain to crypto assets, DAOs, and Web 3.0 which provide added legal challenges and opportunities. And we look forward to hearing from Shobana today. In order to assist with barristers in adjusting to the increasing use of generative artificial intelligence or so Gen AI systems, such as large language models, LLMs, the Bar Council guidance advises, among other things, employing professional judgment to control sensitive data, validating AI outputs, and ensuring AI content doesn't infringe on intellectual property rights. And today, Shorbana will explore opportunities and challenges around the use of generative AI, including anthropomorphism, hallucinations, information disorder, bias, and breaches of confidentiality. So we will now turn to Shorbana for her thoughts and look forward to a fruitful discussion to follow. We have allowed some time at the end of this webinar for an interactive discussion. So please feel free to add your questions to the chat bar and we will try to address these at the end. Thank you, Shorbana. Thank you, Maheshini. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Yes. Um, so thank you. And considering we only got a small group here, by all means, uh, if you want to ask me questions as we go along, I don't mind, because um, we can make this more interactive. And essentially, I really want to start off with Roy Almer's law that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short term and underestimate the effect in the long term. And this is something to bear in mind now, as Maheshin is quite clearly put down, generative AI is quite a broad range of, um, uh, it encompasses a kind of broad range of areas. And I'm really going to be focusing on LLMs, uh, that's large language models, mainly because obviously words and language are the main commodity that we use as lawyers. Um, and I've got here, of course, the Bar Council's guidance on chat GPT, which actually was drafted by myself, um, Ian Mitchell Casey, uh, who is also a Scottish advocate, but also I think a tenant at Hardwick Chambers, and um, Mark Wright, who's in our council from our, from our IT panel of the Bar Council of England and Wales back in June last year. And that was principally following on from the um, kind of catastrophe and the warning that we had from the sanctions made by the US lawyers by using ChatGPT to try and identify some cases. Um, and obviously those cases weren't at all anywhere near correct ca uh, cases. They didn't exist or it, it exist in the, in the um, assertions that it was actually put in their affidavit as a skeleton argument in support for their client's case. So following on from those sanctions, and I know very well um, as Manhattan lawyers have had several other issues, but apart from that, we decided that we needed to get something forward because we knew very well there was actually a, a case that happened in Manchester here where litigants in person, where litigant in person, um, I think on a, on a, on a few days, uh, I don't know if it's a fast, day, a fast track uh, case or another one, but um, came to court with um, authorities as well that didn't actually match or didn't assert assert the proposition that they wanted to do and, and it was following on from the judge questioning this case that did did it come out that the lay, lay um, litigant in person was actually using chat GPT so it's something for us to think about when you're um Looking. So what I'm going to be doing on, on this afternoon, uh, well, this evening, the seminar here now, is I'm going to try and just go through some of the kind of basic principles that um, um, uh, principles that were done actually from 
the first two principles that were done from the uh, generative AI framework from His Majesty's government. And the first principle is that you should know what generative AI is and what its limitations are. And of course, the second principle is that you use generative AI lawfully, ethically and responsibly. So I'll go on uh, to just deal with those. So let's have a look. So when we have a look at um, generative AI, and if I if I told you how many of you were using generative AI, and if I said that majority, I'm sure, have used generative AI, um, not that you probably would have used ChatGPT or, or um, Gemini, etc. But if anybody has used um, Google Translate, for example, that is a generative AI model. Um, but it doesn't, it, and you might be thinking then, we've had Siri, which is also a gen of AI. It takes words, it, it changes, and it makes um, algorithms to actually provide a response back to it in, in a new generative way. But what's special, I think, over the last two years, well, from um, 20, 20, late 2022 to 2023 was when these foundation models came out. And these foundation models actually are, were first coined by a team from Stanford when they saw that the field of AI was converging to a new paradigm uh, where more AI applications were being built by training um, with a library of different AI modules. So previously we've had this sort of single modular uh, adaption or, or reason for um, creating. So whether it's translation, whether it's uh, predicting a, a code between whether they're spam mail or non-spam mail. And of course, we've been using predictive coding in the e-discovery for some time um, with regard to whether it's uh, uh, the document is pr pr protected by legal professional privilege or not, relevant or irrelevant. Uh, those sort of things. But what happened with the foundation models is the fact that they could actually create a, a large, because of the large amount of data from which it was taken, the massive corpus of data sets. And these large foundation models, they are um, accumulation between using large data sets. And I mean, uh, everything from scraping, everything that's publicly available from the internet. And that includes a variety of factors from, um, Wikipedia, from books, anything that they can get on the uh, internet, including things like Gritbyte and Reddit. Just bear that in mind because the majority of users on Reddit are usually male, white, and usually from the American kind of side of things. So just bear that in mind. And then of course they use a pre-training uh, algorithms to, um, they pre-train the algorithms in these um, modules to in order to, actually um, create the next uh, compilation. So what it's trying to do is you probably know that when you're typing in a Google search, it suddenly comes to try and predict the next word, next compilation for it. So it looks at the context and tries to identify what the next word would be. And it's using large amounts of data in that way. But what's made it even more uh, efficient is this idea of a transformer architecture where you can put all these modules together, all these training data together, and create where it can actually do a multimodal sort of area. So it's not just looking at um, finding out uh, or providing a certain particular um, mode of um, for example, translation, et cetera, but it can have, actually look at other different ways. And on top of that, we usually have what's called um, refined, um, uh, on, on top of the transformer model and the free training module, of course, we also have these reinforced uh, learning by human feedback. So when you're actually typing something or when you're actually creating prompts in these um, models, these foundation models, LLM models, like your chat GPT, et cetera, or providing a, a, a positive feedback. That is all form of reinforced uh, human feedback that you're actually providing the model. And of course, all this mixed together in that, and what usually is done is usually you try and fine tune some of this in terms of um, whether it's, because this transformer architecture actually is, what's been used and um, these large language models differ from the, as I said, traditional natural 
uh, language processing solutions because whereas we can use not just a single mode of uh, but many um, neural language uh, models so what you do get is a mixture of all these together is you get you'll see what i mean by the size of this um neural language networks so it's not just um the connections between two neurons and the neural network but the function if you see these functions uh, to cut the story short uh, in this as you'll see that beforehand in 2018 when it was started off this kind of language modeling and foundation modeling, we had about something like about 345 million. And now we're going on to the sex of um, chat GPT-4 where you're having looking at parameters of around 1.4 trillion. Uh, and these are the kind of modes in which it can actually look at different um, information and data to actually provide the answers to your prompts. So that's why it's actually growing and that's why you have this hype that's gone into it. And we've seen that how ChatGPT, you have actually can fine tune it in certain ways, um, in certain sides to try and cater for certain adaptions. So this is why in certain law firms, as you know very well, that um, I think it's Alan and Overy that first um, had um, took on Harvey, which is Harvey is partly fine tuning the chat GPT-4 with open AI to actually create a kind of bespoke uh, internal system for them. Um, so looking at those sort of ideas and the way that it actually works, you probably understand why we came up with this, with the kind of considerations that you ought to really take into um, consideration when you're looking and using these large LLM models. So the first one uh, was is regarding anthropomorphism. And that's the interpretation of non-human things or events in terms of human characteristics. Um, and you know, when one senses sort of like a computer and it seems to be like a chat, uh, and we know very well that humans get so attached sometimes to some of these things, and particularly if you notice about chat, um, a chat GPT, a GPT Omni 4 that's come out where it actually speaks to you when it's supposed to be, it identifies from your facial expression or, um, whether you're feeling upset or not and tries to talk back to you on those. Um, you know, this is actually algorithm. You have to bear in mind that it does not understand language. It just, it's a predictive engine. It's based on text patterns that was previously seen. It can predict uh, completions for a given text input. It does not understand the context or meaning of the content. And particularly, and this is something to bear in mind when you're doing legal, because we have legal words that have specific meanings. So when you're talking about partnership or partner, you've got to be really careful uh, because it could be when you're drafting certain documents, you could be thinking about whether that is actually the right word or the right significance to be given. It, the algorithm does not understand facts. There is no separate mode or information between retrieval and creative writing. So this mode just predicts and the next, the next most probable token, the word or what is on the ongoing sequence. That's what it is. It's an algorithm that looks around. It does not understand manners, emotions, or ethics. So by don't attribute human characteristics to them by claiming that it understands. As you probably heard um, about the Google developer um, early, you know, went and mentioned the LLM or um, sentient. It is not sentient. If I left my Google Chat GPT on and started off typing a prompt but didn't finish the prompt and left it and went away from it for about three or four hours. It's not going to think, where is Shobhana gone? What's happened to her? It doesn't have any kind of emotions or any kind of stuff. So bear that in mind. Don't get scared by it. It's a tool. It's a tool just like when calculators came out. You know, it is a tool to sort of drive and, and understand at the moment the way it's going hallucinations i think we all heard about all these kind of hallucinations that come along and you can understand why because it's pulled out lots of stuff from the internet and it, and as i said it looks at what's the most probable word that would fit in um and that's why the new york lawyers is just one example but there are lots of other conundrums that have happened with regard to allegations about 
um, certain professors um, sexually abusing children um, and, and quite devastating stuff that we don't didn't want to mention on uh, the chat GP on the guidance itself but it can hallucinate some uh, some of these um, facts quite persuas persuasively and in such a manner that anybody would think it's absolutely true so you really have to check you have to know that area um, so that I don't believe it's come to a stage that you can actually rely on it. Even the fine-tuned models like uh, LexisNexis and Westlaw. Uh, recent research has been shown from Stanford that show that even that has 17% hallucinations happening to it. So even though the hallucinations are reduced in these closed circuit stuff, it is part of our responsibility. You know very well that, um, as a, certainly as a barrister, that if you're going to be um, citing cases, we're supposed to have read that case law, we're supposed to be able to put, to show the judge which paragraph it actually we rely on. And we can't just rely on certain, certain paragraphs without reading the full um, context of what that case is, because they could be uh, an exception to the general ratio disanti that's on there. So we have to really look and understand exactly what the case is, what the exemptions are. And this is where the creative mind comes into force because this is how precedence and case law actually grows, right? It's not just on past cases, but it's also looking and thinking, well, my, my, the facts of this case is completely different. And if you look at the reason behind, uh, the purpose behind what, why the policy was done and why the law or the case law was done in a particular way, um, you can actually try and argue in a more innovative way as to why uh, your your client's case is different to those precedents that were there beforehand. So it's something to actually think about when you're looking at hallucinations and, of course, bias. And as I said, biasness and discrimination, it's not just on uh, bad data being put in because of the internet, but also the fact that some of these biases can actually... Um, potentiate the actual injustices that are already existing on there. And also the concern about there's threefold. So there's one about the fact that there's bad data in and bad data out, but there's also the fact that you're actually potentiating the inequalities that already exist. Um, secondly as well, third is a, a fact, the point of how the actually algorithm was um, programmed or done and maybe even the fine tuning of it, is the fine tuning actually causing um, a kind of biasness? And that couldn't, might, not, might not be with regard to discrimination just on the protective characteristics of the Equality Act, but, but things, for example, or when you're doing um, e-discovery, et cetera, whether you are actually missing out a vital component of the case, um, information in the case, et cetera, when you're dealing with things. The black box um, and explainability problems, because of these large language models and the amount of neural networks in there, sometimes you don't understand how you actually catered for some of this. So you have to go with cofactors. You have to look at and think about um, whether there are justifiable grounds when you're using these um, training, you know, LLMs uh, and what you're using for and whether you can actually find a justification. Obviously, if you're using it for something like research and you're checking up the research documentation, etc., that's fine. But if you're looking at it in terms of maybe um, filing out applications for um, traineeship or etc., pupillage, etc., you really have to look and think about whether there are cofactors that are in there or whether you are actually, um, you know, in terms of recruitment, etc., whether there are any kind of discrimination in there and whether you can actually provide um, a clear context in which um, the participant who is actually being dealt with by um, or actually being um, shortlisted through algorithms, et cetera, are going to be actually provided with a, a fair way of um, challenging those decisions. And of course, I'd say the last, the, the three main ones, and I know I'm running out of time already, is on data protection and confidentiality. You know, where well, data protection is an issue, anything that you put into, especially these open AI modules, but even the closed ones, I would say that you can retract a lot of the personal data, et cetera, in there. Uh, and you want to make sure, especially in the open models like ChatGPT3, et cetera, uh, because everything that you put into the prompt is actually going back to the old world, the public. And that, that of course, 
follows on with intellectual property rights, etc. If you've got trade secrets, etc. on there that you're actually mentioning out, that would no longer be a trade secret. And, uh, and also with regard to what the answers are given. So if you go and ask it, for example, um, give me 10 names for um, uh, Art and Metaverse event, for example, it might come up with certain names that are associated with companies or brands. So you've got to be careful about how you look at those and check those up that you're not infringing somebody else's or you could be challenged for passing off something. Um, and of course, legal professional privilege is another um, issue that you want to make sure that you don't put into um, open models, etc. Um, what are the use cases? Well, we know where well, legal research is definitely uh, being used. Um, uh, LexisNexis have opened their um, AI research. We know Westlaw has also got co-counsel, which is going to be, uh, which is, if it hasn't been opened up here yet, it's going to be opened up in the UK jurisdiction. Document review and e-discovery is one of those areas that we've been using predictive coding for quite some time. Now, whether we're going to move into, and I think it's one of those areas where they're trying to move into generative AI factors, that could be one of those. The other one is, of course, drafting. We know that not just drafting emails um, or letters before action, et cetera, um, and even pleadings, et cetera, from these precedents, because you've got the compilation of all these precedents from years beforehand. Um, whether all that is fine-tuned into the model, you'll probably find that a lot of the drafting and precedents will be there for you to be able to easily draft documents in the future. In terms of other points in the legal sector, which are upcoming and looking at, of course, it's a due diligence on, com uh, on compliance. We know that a lot of it's going to be uh, dealt with, with ALM and KYC searches, etc. How much it is, whether it's moved into the generative AI factor, it's a question mark at the moment. I know in terms of case management side of it, you might have heard of things like Trial View and Opus 2, um, which is mainly used in the arbitration world at the moment, where uh, apparently you can upload the full bundle and then the client's, uh, um, I mean, the phone's witness statement and, for example, ask um, the algorithm to say, can you spot me any documents which uh, are against or oppose this uh, assertion made by the witness and it's supposed to bring it out. Now, my question mark about this, and it's all, always been a question mark which I had with regard to also what was happening previously with regard to patent applications is would this be used by lawyers um, in the future? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be your duty to actually, if, if you had an algorithm like this, wouldn't it be it, your duty to actually go and check this up before you, you know, when you're drafting the witness statement that you go and put it up and check up and find if there are any inconsistencies with the witness statements and then ask your client, is that correct? Or what do you say about X, Y and Z? Just like how you usually ask counsel to review witness statements, et cetera, um, in that way, would you be going around using it to actually identify those kind of, um, you know, miss um, uh, drafting points in advance? Litigation analyt analytics is another area where I think people are thinking about moving into whether generative AI will be there to go around giving a judicial analysis um, beforehand to say that if you're in front of this particular judge, you're likely to have uh, X percentage chance of success, etc. And of course, there's other forms of research as well that can be used by generative AI. You can ask it to um, try and compile you know, a particular amount of information for you, uh, which experts, what you probably ask for an expert to do, etc. But you, as I said, you probably need to verify it with the expert anyway. So there are kind of wide varieties. I'm not going to go through this uh, um, in detail because I know I'm running out of time as well, but there's a LexisNexis report on generative AI and the future of the legal profession. And as you can see from here, that um, there is a kind of wide uh, compilation of what has been used. So from research matters, drafting documents, you've seen that document analysis, you've seen the percentages. And you can see from here as well, the idea that small that small firms are planning to use generative AI as well, um, as well as the public sector. The bar, probably not so much because we are all reliant on our um, instructing solicitors to be using the AI factors in there. Uh, but you can download this report if you haven't already downloaded it. There is also on that that shows that um, 
73% of lawyers expect to integrate gender of AI into legal work, and 87 say that technology has improved their day-to-day -day work. Um, I wonder what they mean by the full amount of technology in that, because we all know that technology has uh, improved our work, but whether it's actually generative AI, it's another question mark for me. Um, and if you're in the um, arbitration side of things, you would probably have known about this, but if you haven't, uh, we've had the um, Byron Clave Leighton Fess's um, report that was done last year on the use of uh, AI tools in arbitration, in international arbitration. And you can see that most people think that, that they know um, what, um, you know, uh, the generation of factual summaries, etc. You can see that how many of them would like to use it and how many of them think that they know and they understand it. I really do question some of that though. But um, I mean, I'll finish off there and I have questions, but I'm happy to answer any questions on, that's come out.